without Worlds, esports would look completely different. The stage shows you're used to in every game from CSGO to fighting games, the production quality you hope to see in every esports stream, the level of play you want from the biggest tournaments, all started at Worlds. Every year, Riot gathers the biggest teams in League of Legends to face off against one another. The prize pool isn't as big as some other events, but that hardly matters. Worlds is when everything is on the line. For the longest time, it was the only international tournament that mattered. But putting all that aside, Worlds changed esports. And every year, fans hope that Riot can do it all over again. This is its story. These days, Worlds is one of the biggest productions in esports. It's run as long as six weeks takes place in massive venues all over the world and dishes out hundreds of thousands of dollars in prize money alongside one of esports' most sought-after trophies, the Summoner's Cup. But the first Worlds wasn't the event we've come to know today. Now that we're wrapping up Season 1, we really want to continue to evolve the experience to help establish it as one of the top esports titles in the world. World Season 1 was announced just two months before the tournament started, with teams determined through a set of regional qualifiers. Epic Gamer, Team Solo Mid, and Counter Logic Gaming represented NA. Against All Authority, Fnatic, and Game.de came from Europe, and Xan and Team Pacific qualified out of SEA. With the teams in place, the League of Legends community gathered at DreamHack Summer in Yon Shopping, Sweden, in a venue that, somewhat lovingly, somewhat sarcastically, is referred to as Freak's Basement. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Almia Convention Center at Yon Shopping, Sweden. We are here for the DreamHack Summer 2011 Championship Game. The final's about to go underway, a $100,000 tournament held by League of Legends and Riot Games. Obviously, DreamHack Summer didn't take place on the bottom floor of League caster David Freak Turley's home, but the whole affair was pretty low-key, especially compared to its more recent iterations. Season 1 Worlds might not have featured the most exciting high-level play by today's standards. But here's the mistake, he turns around randomly, getting himself back into range and then shields, which means actually he lets Savage just walk back into range to pick up the kill. But at the time, it was the absolute peak of Pro League of Legends and it was only the beginning. It's been an amazing end of our season one, and like, and like Cabot said, we're just getting started. Season two is going to be amazing. Absolutely, and thank you to everyone at home. You've really made this event such an overwhelming success. We thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll see you next year. Season two was the first Worlds that Riot had planned in advance. Announced in May, with regional finals taking place throughout the summer, world structure was more organized, the prize pool was higher, and there were even more teams in attendance. It was the beginning of Worlds as we know it. After the regional winners have been declared, the top 12 teams will then put it all on the line during the Season 2 World Championship in Los Angeles, California. And all eyes were on European stalwarts, Moscow 5. Now the fight's about to start again. Initiation comes in from Darian. Good job, kid. Almost. Oh, he does get taken down. He doesn't even get a chance to attack. Zatai falling to Moscow 5, then Q. Alex, he's coming up very big, but it's Diamond Prax with the double kill. The chase down to BDD is just too strong, and this completely spells barren in 29 minutes for Moscow 5, then Q. And CLG Europe. Diamond Pro trying to get away from this one. Yellow Pete's just gonna jump on his face any minute now. There we go, the shutdown comes in. The ace comes out from CLG. This is insane. But few anticipated the threats from the east. Azubu Frost and Najin Black Sword dominated the group stage. This should do it indeed. It is going to be Najin Sword going 3 and 0 oh in the group. Both Korean teams matching up the victory there for Najin Sword. Absolutely outstanding performance from both these teams. While surprise winners Taipei Assassins came out of nowhere to take the top spot. Taipei Assassins to do now on the shockwave! Pulls in, comes out of the BB picks up a kill on Chase there. Shy goes down, my life getting skipped. And in the end, they hoisted the Summoner's Cup. Of 
course, Riot makes video games, not trophies, and no one thought about the fact that the winning team would actually have to lift it. Which led to the Summoner's Cup weighing 70 pounds, the heaviest sports trophy in the world. Which, some would argue, is indicative of some of the growing pains that Riot had to deal with at Season 2 Worlds in general. Season 2's Worlds was bigger and more impressive. The Grand Finals marked the first Western esports tournament to sell out a sports stadium. But Riot wasn't as prepared for that as they'd hoped to be. The first and perhaps most notable issue was the way the stage was set up. Players were seated in front of the screen, meaning they could just turn around and take a peek. Most notably, Azubu Frost allegedly used this in a match against Team Solo Mid to get a read on a cheesy level 1 gank. And I want to call, call attention to actually the uh, Team Solo Mid's Wraith brush. So they saw, Azubu Frost saw that TSM shoved that top lane and, and a lot of people went up there. So Cloud Templar made the move into TSM's jungle and tossed a sapling down there at that brush by the Wraith camp, which allows them to see just what TSM is trying for. But by the end of the tournament, Riot found four instances of screen cheating, even one from TSM's Dyrus, who alleges he looked back to prove that players could see the screen. And as soon as we saw that pause, we're like, holy shit, our plan might not work. We looked straight to Zoom Frost, and Chaos notices their players looking at our map, looking at the mini map, and they start like talking. And then um, there's also proof in the replay that there's been pings at dark areas where we're standing where they have no vision of. Riot let the players off with a fine and admitted it was their mistake, but it marked one of the biggest scandals in competitive league history. On top of that, viewers at home experienced some issues with the broadcast. The tournament was plagued by technical issues, which meant plenty of pauses and plenty of silver scrapes. So we're here at day four, the day that was never meant to happen. It is the extended world playoffs. And as you can see, the construction is going on behind us right now. Hopefully things will happen all to plan today. But Riot took it all in stride. World Season 2 was one of the most successful, widely viewed esports events the West had ever seen. And Riot used it as a springboard to create one of the most important esports events in history. Thank you for watching the Season 2 World Championships, and we will see you in Season 3. Good night! Before World Season 3, the West's esports scene was drastically different than what it is today. Tournaments were small, often held in hotels or convention centers. Dota 2's The International was unique in 2013 for selling out a concert venue, but TI2 was tied to PAX Prime and not its own event. Season 3 Worlds was the culmination of Riot's efforts to bring as much of League of Legends esports in-house as possible. Instead of teams qualifying through regional qualifiers after a year of third-party tournaments, they qualify through Riot's own leagues. The NA scene has gotten so strong, it's eight teams going in and competing for first place. Riot set up the NALCS and EU LCS while licensing out league operations in China to Tencent, Garena in Southeast Asia, and OGN in Korea. Teams would qualify from around the world for a shot at the biggest tournament Western esports had ever seen. Season 3 Worlds was held in California again, but this time the Grand Finals took place at the Staples Center, a 21,000-seat basketball and hockey stadium that hosted the likes of Kobe Bryant and Wayne Gretzky making it the biggest audience to attend an esports event in the West's history. It was a landmark for the scene and a sign that esports wasn't just some passing fad. It was growing and League of Legends was leading the charge. But it wasn't just those optics that made people pay attention. World Season 3 was all about the Korean hype train. <laughs> All aboard the Korean hype train, SK Telecom G1! After Korea's strong performance the year before, all eyes were on Najin Black Sword, Samsung Ozone, and of course, SK Telecom T1 and a young mid laner named Faker. But SKT weren't the only strong team in attendance. Moscow 5's legacy lived on in Gambit Gaming, who put on a strong performance in Group B. Got the crescendo down from this one, Stranglethorn's coming in, Voidal going so very, very low, Looper has teleported down as well, but look at him, 
taking so much damage, we'll have to use the barrier. Cataclysm goes down. Darian going to charge on through. Here comes Diamond and Gendra. They've managed to get the slow down. Looper charging on the way back towards his turret with that ultimate. And he's ghost running. And now Alex moving in. Misses the charm. That's not going to allow him to lock up the rise. But a two for one. Brilliant turnaround from Gambit. Only trumped by Fnatic's utter dominance in the same group. And you cannot run from this Fnatic team. They chase everyone down on Ozo. 21 kills to six, a clean ace, and another surrender from Ozo. Meanwhile, Group A was ruled by SKT and China's OMG. And these teams might be waiting on their supports ultimates right now, like Special's Crescendo as well as the Stranglethorns aren't there, but OMG, never mind, they don't wait! Stranglethorns, Root goes down, Grasping Roots, Reginald taking low, Lovelin passing pops once again, but it's Dyrus being focused, Cool gets him the kill, Slicing Maelstrom comes on through, and Special Wild Turtle all locked up at the back there, then Go going just backs away, takes down Wild Turtle, Reginald tries to slide on through, but he just simply gives another kill to Cool, and that was a three! Four for one for OMG. And Chinese champions Royal Club with superstar AD carry Uzi seemed unstoppable in the bracket with wins over OMG. This is going to be a win for Royal Club. They are going to take down their Chinese rivals. Two to zero. Amazing performance to Zed. And Fnatic. They fly onto Whites. They take down Whites. If they can get Uzi, they may get the damage out, but the DPS is still there, D-Man. They're moving on to the Nexus. That was the big if, and they could not do it. Uzi is alive. Uzi is doing damage. It's Royal Club going through to the Grand Final. But as has become something of a world's tradition, one of the tournament's best matches took place in the semifinals. SKT and Najin, two Korean titans, clashed for a spot in the Grand Finals. Kane is dead in this one. He's not going to be able to escape it. Are they going to keep going for it, though? Expression going to dive in. Here comes Prey from the side. And what? all of a sudden, he gets the first kill on towards Baker. Impact to make it. Oh, the guys! Nagle going deep. He's going to die from the tower. Piglet picks that one up in the end. A crazy, crazy fight. Ends in three for two. Faker's in trouble there. That was a flash body slam. Oh, he got him! He gets him with the ultimate. Now Bengi's caught out. He manages to get pop. The blood has been activated. Nightmare's gonna throw down a barrel. That explodes. That's two kills now for Sword. Not gonna connect. Faker still alive. It's now Nightmare's in trouble. He's got the shockwave. Still alive! And there is the shockwave coming down. But Faker, so very low. Expression nice. Faker's still alive. Oh! oh Protect comes in. Kane trying to get the kill. Kane does get the kill. Nightmare re engages. Oh! A massive shockwave. Throws the Three of them together. The first victim is watching the rest of Sword are on the retreat. Ladies and gentlemen, SKT have done it. This is the victory here. This is the final for SK Telecom T1. But it was SKT and Faker who struck the last blow, moving on to the finals where they swept Royal to lift their first Summoner's Cup. The Nexus turrets are potentially going to go down. This could be a 20-minute game for SK Telecom. They will be the Season 3 World Champions here at the Staples Center. Ladies and gentlemen, the hype train is real. SK Telecom have won two trophies in the space of being together for six months. Yeah, this is a, almost a new team. And not even say almost a few months of last year into this year. Season 3 Worlds was the beginning of a legacy that would go on to define competitive League of Legends. It was the beginning of a saga that saw Faker transform from a young prodigy into a champion, and in turn, the greatest player to ever touch the game. It was also yet another sign that North America, a strong region in the scene's early days, was beginning to fall behind the competition. TSM had attended all three Worlds up to that point, but bombed out of groups with a dismal 2-6 record. C9, the North American champions who dominated the NALCS under the leadership of High, lost 2-1 to Fnatic in the quarterfinals. Fnatic are going to go through to the semi-finals, taking down the North American champions, Cloud9. Despite the enormous hometown crowd, NA teams just couldn't cut it at Worlds but the crowds didn't care. Once the NA teams were out, nationality was left at the door. Fans came to see the best League of Legends possible, and the teams delivered. Nobody's touching Piglet, they're all running away. Baker makes the fight continue, puts Godlike in the fray, and they're gonna take down the turret. Oh, oh my gosh. Between the storylines, the quality of the play, and of course, the incredible level of production, there was nothing more impressive in esports that year than Worlds. 
Sure, ESL and DreamHack were running tournaments back then, but they didn't look like they do now. TI was still a year away from $10 million prize pools and filling up Key Arena. EVO was years away from Mandalay Bay, and the CSGO majors hadn't even started yet. There's no question. World Season 3 set the standard for modern esports. Riot set the trend and showed the world what esports could look like. And most that came after decided it was what esports should look like. Every esports tournament wanted to fill up the Staples Center, but Worlds did it. I really cannot believe that I'm actually saying this, but that does it for the League of Legends Season 3 World Championship. So on behalf of the entire broadcast team, good night and thanks for watching. If Season 3 Worlds was Riot proving they could put on the biggest esports show in the West, Season 4 Worlds was them proving it could work on a global stage. Season 4 took Worlds to East Asia, with matches played in Taipei, Singapore, Busan, and Seoul. The finals were held in an even bigger venue than the Staples Center, the Seoul World Cup Stadium, a 66,000-seat arena that was built for the 2002 FIFA World Cup. It was bigger in every way, with even more teams in attendance. Riot opened up more spots for Southeast Asian and international wildcard teams to compete, which began a legacy of underdog teams playing spoiler and messing with the competition. Kaboom Esports may have finished last in their group, but their single win over Alliance provided one of the most hype, least expected moments from the entire tournament pushing Alliance out of contention for a spot in the playoffs. And I can't believe it, D-Man! Kaboom takes the game over Alliance! What the hell just happened? But this time, all eyes were on Samsung White and Samsung Blue, two of the best teams in Korea. Both teams were strong, but since Blue had defeated White throughout the year, many saw them as a slight favorite. But after a shocking 3-0 victory for White in the semifinals... And they do not hesitate to drop the Nexus! It's only going to take three! Samsung White finally defeats Samsung Blue! And in such a remarkable fashion! Blue's captain, Dade the General, handed his signature jacket over to Pawn to signify a changing of the guard. And with that jacket on his back, Han made sure to leave his mark. The same Nexus story for, they're going to focus in on the Nexus itself and Samsung White are the 2014 World Champions. But Season 4 Worlds wasn't the biggest esports event of 2014. After the incredible show Riot put on the year before, several esports tournament organizers stepped up their game. Most notably, the Dota 2 community put together the largest prize pool in esports history for TI4, with $10.9 million shared across the 14 participating teams. Riot didn't increase their prize pool for Worlds in response. In fact, it stayed at just over $2 million, taking some of the wind out of their sails. Sure, Riot took the tournament on a grand tour of Europe, from London to Paris to Berlin, but somehow it didn't feel as big as some of the competition. On top of that, the tournament ran in the middle of one of Riot's most frustrating metas. The Juggernaut meta defined Worlds 2015, with the same champions being picked and banned for most of the playoffs. Yeah, and as for EDG's bans, I think since they're on red side, they may just be locked into the Gangplank, Mordekaiser, and Elise. Yeah. Partway into the tournament, Gragas, Ziggs, and Lux were disabled as well, bringing champion diversity even further down. Gragas was one of just a few viable junglers in the meta, and without him, fans got very used to watching the same comps duke it out over the course of a month. The issue that appeared in-game prevented Rainover from casting the Gragas Q spell, and the refereeing team, they did investigate and exhaust every single option to resolve the issue in-game, including allowing Gragas to die and attempt to resolve the matter. As for the games themselves, Samsung's win the previous season highlighted the Korean exodus, which saw a number of LPL teams sign top-tier LCK players in the hopes of finally breaking China's second-place curse at Worlds. This included all members of both Samsung teams. It wasn't the first time a defending champion wasn't in attendance to defend their championship, but after two straight years of Korean dominance, many hoped the streak would break. Cloud9, who ran the impossible gauntlet to make it to Worlds 2015, looked incredible, going undefeated in their first week of groups. 
sneak east side. There's a turret alive that they gotta be careful. A big knockback, and that's the kill of the Morgana. Azir goes down as well, but the tugs are coming through. A double kill for Balls, a triple kill for that's Balls. Holy cow, the go. A double kill for Balls, holy cow. And Z Tai backs away oh. as well. A double kill already for Incarnation. The damage is 2 0. Watch C9 completes the ace, and they complete the 2 0 already at Worlds but couldn't keep the momentum going, and along with the rest of NA, went winless in week two. And what a heartbreaking defeat, though. Yeah, Cloud9 getting essentially uh, reverse swept here, 3-0 into 0-4 later on, but... Meanwhile, following TSM's disappointing finish, beloved top laner Marcus Dyrus Hill announced his retirement, bringing the crowd to tears and providing one of the league's most touching moments. Now it's time to open a new book Right now, my story ends here, but I still, even with me gone, I still want everyone to support TSM and all of, all of my teammates. Not only did Korea continue to dominate, the grand finalists, Ku Tigers and SKT, swept nearly every team they played. The only team able to put up a fight against either was KT Rolster, the third Korean team at the tournament. And in those grand finals, Faker led SKT to victory once again, making the team the first ever two-time world champions. Ku Tigers are falling. SKT will be your first ever two-time world champions. As a team, they will do so. SK Telecom T1, your two-time world champions. All eyes are on League of Legends during Worlds. The venues wow the crowds, and the champions display the absolute highest level of play. But between the prize pool discrepancy, North America's complete disaster of a tournament, and the terrible meta, Riot needed to ratchet things up for Season 6. Season 6 Worlds did bring some changes. For one, Riot actually increased the prize pool through fan contributions. And while it wasn't a scratch on TI's prize pool, the increase to $5 million was a welcome change. Then, perhaps in response to the sudden meta change ahead of Worlds 2015, Riot played it on a patch nearly a month old, giving players plenty of time to experiment with new picks, like Gorilla's Misfortune support. An insta-lock misfortune. Something really weird. I don't care about my last point. And to bring it all together, Riot took Worlds back to NA, back to the Staples Center. Things weren't perfect, but the tournament was more exciting. Europe seemed stronger, with H2K taking first in their group in a tiebreaker match against EDG. And it looks like H2K will seal the deal! Your first seed from Group C going to the quarterfinals! Wildcard legends Albus Knox Luna made a deep tournament run, becoming the first wildcard team to make it out of groups. All I want to say is that, hey guys, we are from Wildcard. And they have said, told you before, being underdog doesn't mean being a loser, that's all. And Samsung Galaxy provided the first ever five game World's Grand Finals against defending champions SKT. The wave. Might have some kill trap. Oh, oh, oh. He's still getting he the last tick. He's on the ground. Solo kills Faker. The Nexus is being killed. There's two members of Samsung against three members of SK Telecom. And the Nexus goes down. The defending world champions win game one. It looks oh, like we Samsung go. are coming back. They've killed Faker, found Bengi, and moving on to Duke Crown. He's tagging in with the stars. They're peeling backwards. No, oh, Nexus. The Nexus is down. Samsung stunned the world and defeat SKT for their first game in finals. And Samsung Galaxy are being dove under their tower. SK Telecom have overcome every challenge. They are the undisputed best team in the world. The SKT reign continues. They win their third. But of course, SKT prevailed, turning their legacy into a dynasty. With three world championship titles under their belts, it seems impossible for anyone to ever upset their place as League's greatest team and Faker as League's greatest player. But every dynasty has to fall eventually. Worlds 2017 took things to China for the first time, with a tour through Wuhan, Guangzhou, Shanghai, and Beijing, ending the tournament in the Bird's Nest, the biggest venue in League of Legends history.
This time, Riot shook things up with a larger play-in stage that saw the lowest seeds from every region but Korea play against the champions of the wildcard regions for four slots in the group stage. Gigabyte Marines provided 2017's fun wildcard matches, taking games off Immortals and Fnatic, and while they didn't make it out of groups, neither did two of the North American teams. But Cloud9, ever the world's hopefuls, made it to the quarterfinals and took Team WE to five games, giving NA fans just a little more faith in their region. WE will hold on. They weather a brutal storm, and Waterley will push themselves to a historic semi-final. Meanwhile, all eyes were on Longju Gaming, the first seed out of Korea and new favorites to take SKT's crown. Unfortunately, they fell to Samsung Galaxy, 3-0 in the quarterfinals. As they take down their first opponent, they are the first in the semifinals, and who can really stop this team? While both Misfits and Royal Never Give Up pushed SKT to five games, back to back. SK Telecom T1 will be your second team in the semifinals, claiming victory over Misfits Gaming. SKT, masters of control, will take down the Nexus, will take down RNG, and are headed to their fourth world championship final. In the end, Samsung emerged victorious with a swift 3-0 victory over SKT, earning their org a second world's trophy and ending the SKT dynasty. The It shocked the world, but perhaps more importantly, it shocked Faker, who was moved to tears by his first major international loss in years. Worlds isn't the only tournament that matters anymore. For League, there's MSI to show off the international strength. And for esports in general, tournaments like TI, the Majors, even EVO have stepped up their production values to match Worlds. But somehow, Worlds is still magical every time. It's not just about the best teams in the world competing on the world stage. It's not just about the tours Riot makes, taking fans from venue to venue with a unique show in each one. It's not just about the extraordinary levels of production that Riot somehow manages to top each year. It's about what the tournament stands for. Worlds pushed esports forward. It cemented what the modern major tournament should look like, what it should feel like for both players and the fans. Ever since that grand finals at the Staples Center, esports has never turned back. Worlds changed esports. Every year, fans tune in to see if they can do it again. Thanks for watching. If you want more great content just like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button.